So this is uh, this is a hard act to follow. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm presenting work uh, with my colleagues, um, this is George, George Foster, Pierre Isabelle, and uh, Roland Kuhn. And I guess probably a number of people in the room are, are um, quite familiar with machine translation. But then again, uh, some of you may not be so that much. So um, I'll go over just a little bit of background just to make sure we're all, we're, uh, um, all on the same page. So um, going back just a bit, um, machine translation I, is probably or certainly one of the first um, applications that was foreseen for electronic computers. And as early as the 1940s, uh, Warren Weaver and, and other people as well were, you know, thinking, hey, if we, if we had these electronic computers, well, maybe we could do this. And so I think it's fair to say that um, of all the artificial intelligence applications that you can think of today, uh, machine translation is probably the one that has the longest and the most distinguished history of making errors. Um, <laughs> and and um, so Lucia talked about and showed some, er some of these errors and uh, she, she used the word grotesque. Um, I think that maybe amusing uh, is another adjective that you could think of uh, for a lot of these. Uh, m most of the time they're boring, but there's lots of them. There's, there's, there's a long history of, of errors and, and they've been uh, quite well uh, studied and documented and analyzed and, and so on. And maybe n nowhere, probably the, the, the most notorious place where they were, or at least the first notorious place where they were documented was the ALPAC report just um, in 1966. Um, and um, I, I took this bit here from, from the ALPAC report because I think it's, it's interesting to see that these ideas we're, we've been talking about post-editing for uh, yesterday uh, a little bit. And, and these, are the, these ideas are, are really not new. Um, and actually, I had, I, I had another quote from, from a... Um, um, a Bar Hillel paper from 1960 where he talks extensively about post-editing. Um, uh, in, in this quote here, they talk about the, um, uh, the Georgetown University uh, project that went on in the 1950s, actually, between, I think it was between 1953 and 1962. Um, and uh, the report says, um, when after eight years of work, the Georgetown U University MT project tried to produce useful output in 1962, they had to resort to post-editing. Um, the post-edited translation took slightly longer to do and was more expensive than conventional human translation. So you might think that um, uh, moving fast forward about 50 years now, um, things have not changed much. Uh, <laughs> I think it was, uh, uh, well, uh, Catherine yesterday said that um, we, uh, after all these, this time, we still need to, if, you, if what you want is high quality translation, you still need to do post editing. Um, one thing that is changing, however, and that's a very recent change, I would say, um, is that suddenly, it seems that maybe this last part here of the ALPAC evaluation, this last part may not be as true anymore. It seems like um, the quality of machine translation now, um, MT is maybe is just good enough, maybe just fast enough, just cheap enough that maybe this last part is not true anymore. And what that does is that suddenly and I'm saying suddenly because this is, I, I, the way I, I see this, maybe this is something that's been changing over the three, four last years. Um, LSPs, translation companies, are suddenly seriously taking machine translation and saying, hey, maybe this is something we should try. To have machine translation as a translation support tool for um, human translators. And they're seriously considering using post-editing. And some of them are 
even reporting <coughs> impressive uh, numbers in terms of productivity gains. Um, even in some cases, they're talking about um, getting better quality using post-editing. So, well, this, I, I guess this has to be, still has to be proven, but uh, it, it's interesting. But one of the consequences of this, and this is, this is interesting, is that um, just uh, as I'm talking right now, possibly thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people are sitting in front of computers, staring at machine translation output, analyzing the errors, and fixing them. These are people doing post-editing, and they're being paid to do that. Some might argue underpaid, but it's, the, the truth is that a lot of people are doing that. And so not only is that um, machine translation is changing the way translators do translation, but it could also be changing the way that machine translation is, is being done. Because suddenly we have access to um, a, a, a new layer of data in the form of um, annotated, neatly annotated uh, machine translation output. And um, so, and, and this is like really a new layer of data. You used to have like source text and target text, and now you have an intermediate layer. You have this machine translation, and you have annotations, specific annotations saying where the errors are and how to fix them. And of course, there are problems with this data. Um, there's problems with uh, inter-annotator agreement. So this is, these two things are the same empty output, um, just post-edited differently. So um, depending on the context, depending on the person doing the post-editing, you might get some quite different results. Um, but that's, uh, that's something that we will have to deal with. Um, I was trying to think, are there other um, applications where uh, we have access to this kind of data on a large scale? And it's, it's not clear to me that there are uh, many other uh, applications where, where, where we have that. But anyway, I, I, was just, I, I just found it interesting to see that, okay, well, this is, this is something that we have now on a large scale. Potentially, um, and I think it, it was uh, actually Laurent yesterday who was mentioning that uh, it's not necessarily easy to access this data. Sometimes it's hidden in, in, the, in, in the, uh, the archives of the, the translation companies or the clients or something like that, but the data is there. So the next question is what do we do with it? Um, one obvious application for this kind of data is to, well, maybe we can use it to improve the quality of the machine translation. Um, and the real challenge here is, um, can we do this in real time? Can we um, take what the post editor is doing, this sort of annotation error and annotation error correction, and can we feed it back um, to the system and try to improve the quality of the MT? Um, and do this in real time as the translator is working. And one of the approaches to just say, well, okay, these new post-edited translations, they're just more translations and we can feed them back into the machine translation system. And a number of people have been looking at this and this is a hard problem because typically um, the models that these, uh, the at least statistical empty systems are dealing with are, they're huge and then you have to, um, Think about how do you balance this new information with regard to the old information that was in there. But uh, nevertheless, a number of people have started looking into this. Um, we have been looking at a different way of, of exploiting the same data to do the same thing, which is, well, rather than try to learn from the translations themselves, why don't we just learn the corrections and apply them on not touch, the, not touch the empty system itself, but just try to fix it as the post editor does and do this in real time. So you can see this as a process that's sitting on the translator's shoulder and looking what he or she is doing, um, trying to um, collect corrections, learn them, 
and possibly apply them further down the road. And there's probably different ways in which you can do this. The approach that we have been taking is to view this as, as a machine translation or as a translation problem. You can see this as a problem of uh, translated raw machine translation output into correct machine translation output. So it's uh, a, a string transformation problem that you can view as a translation problem. And so we're doing this using machine translation uh, machinery. Um, the only thing is that this is, in this case, we're using a phrase-based uh, statistical MT system to do this um, with incremental updates. So as the post editor is working, um, we're basically examining what, what the post editor is doing, uh, looking at the corrections, extracting them, um, basically the same kinds of, of uh, annotation that, w that we just saw. Um, and from there, we extract a whole bunch of possible corrections that you can learn from that. And we, um, we throw that into uh, basically an SMT systems phrase table. And then we use that um, to uh, try to apply these corrections to further machine translation output um, further down in the same document. Um, and we do that using standard machine translation decoding. Um, and then what determines whether or not we apply a specific correction in a specific context is um, basically how often this correction, uh, this specific correction has been seen. Um, and uh, also what um, the language model component of, this is of the machine translation uh, system thinks. And in this case, we're using uh, uh, language model mixtures. Uh, we're basically mixing uh, a background language model with uh, a language model that is trained on uh, the raw machine translation output and another, another one that's trained on the post-edited out output. We're mixing these three together. Um, and we're um, basically doing um, machine translation on the machine translation output. And we call this thing post-edit propagation, or PEPPER for short. So we're adding PEPPER. Um, and does it, does it work? So um, the experimental results, and these are simulation experiments. We're not we're doing this for real right now. Um, intuitively, it's what you would think. It works if you have repetitive text, text with re where you have a lot of internal repetition and therefore um, uh, repeated errors. So um, just to give you uh, uh, an idea, these, these uh, four first conditions here are the kinds of situations where the system does work. Uh, the last two here are the kinds of situations where um, it doesn't hurt. Uh, it doesn't help. It, d it doesn't really work. But it doesn't hurt either. We're not uh, in major ways. And um, this is the word array that you get on the, um, on the raw data, on the raw MT output. Um, word error rate is interesting in this case because in the post-editing context, it tells you basically how, what proportion of the words need to be uh, fixed, what proportion of the empty output words need to be edited. And so you see that when, the, when this thing works, you get very nice reductions uh, on the order of, I don't know, in this case, I think it's anywhere between 4 and 6% and uh, absolute uh, word error rate. So basically, when it works, it works. It works well. Um, what's interesting to see, to look at, however, is this last column here. This isn't the percentage of words that are actually modified by this post-editing, uh, this uh, post-edit propagation uh, process. Um, and it's interesting to compare these numbers uh, with the actual gain in terms of word error rate. So these, these blue bars here are, are these, the percentage of words that are modified by this error correction mechanism. Um, and the red bars 
are the actual gain in word error rate. And what you can see here is that um, a th only a small proportion of the error corrections that we're doing actually give us some gain. It's not clear exactly what is happening here. Is it possible, that, is it the case that um, uh, some of the errors are actually, uh, some of the uh, corrections that we're doing are actually hurting um, and then some more corrections are helping and it's just a balance between the two. Um, maybe more likely is that the machine translation, the raw machine translation is already bad enough um, that we can actually do corrections and maybe we're just not hurting because it's just bad anyway. So we're just changing something bad with something bad. Uh, it's not a problem. But it's interesting to see that uh, a lot of the corrections that we're uh, applying right now are not, uh, are certainly not helping. And so uh, essentially that's where we are right now. We're currently um, analyzing the errors of our error correction mechanism. And so we're um, doing something that machine translation people don't do very often. We're looking at system outputs um, and trying to figure out what, what's going on uh, and looking at uh, specific uh, uh, examples, uh, specific corrections that the system is doing. So we can see here that uh, the empty output, is, we had this uh, um, French sentence here, pendant toute la durée du traitement, l'hématocrite ne doit pas dépasser 48%. And then you have the, the uh, English, where uh, the machine translation output, where the word treatment was changed to therapy. Uh, turns out the reference was treatment. So in this case, uh, we see that we're actually, our error correction is actually degrading the quality of the output. Um, and then here we had shall, which is changed into should. Um, as it turns out, the output does contain should, so we do have a gain here in terms of, of uh, uh, word error rate and, and so on. And as we do this, we're trying to understand uh, which ones of these corrections are helping, which ones are, uh, are, are hurting our performance, um, and, and maybe try to understand a little bit better what's going on. And one of the things that we've realized in doing this, this analysis is that um, a lot of our um, errors in the error correction are actually due to bad alignments. That is the way that we analyze the post-editor's work and try to extract corrections from that, uh, reapplicable corrections. Um, so obviously maybe uh, have, using a better alignment would help us. Um, but what we're realizing also is that um, our alignment methods typically run into trouble, into situations where there's so much post-editing going on that maybe it's not at all possible to recuperate anything from that and to learn anything useful from that. And maybe we should just um, discard these post-edited examples that are too complicated, um, where there's too much going on. Um, another thing that we uh, were uh, finding out is that there's just some corrections that just don't generalize well. And there's a, a list of examples here. But basically, these are errors that are contextual by nature. And um, uh, again, I don't remember um, who showed this example. I think it was Catherine who showed this example yesterday, where changing, post-editing something um, somewhere in the sentence forces you to do another change somewhere else in the sentence. And if you're learning these two things in a disconnected way, then obviously you're not going to gain anything um, by applying it systematically uh, later on. And so basically that's where we are right now with this um, um, error correction uh, and, and error analysis uh, process. Um, so the question is what, we, what are we going to do with that? Well, one possible idea is to come up with a, a, a list, a set of rules of thumb that we can apply to decide, well, okay, this is the kind of corrections, corrections that we're going to focus on and, and just exclude all the rest uh, and, and try to go for precision rather than, than catch everything. Um, maybe a more promising avenue is to um, try to come up with a, some sort of confidence estimation on the 
on specific corrections, basically on the stuff that we put into the phrase table, um, uh, associate confidence, uh, some sort of confidence measure to these things, uh, which would reflect um, how likely it is that a specific correction uh, is reusable, is generalizable. And this could be used either to prune the phrase table or it could be used as an additional feature in the decoding process. And that's where we are right now. We're looking into ways of doing this. And that's all I have to say. Um, it's interesting because we had uh, a discussion yesterday. Uh, the question was, uh, what happens if you improve your MT system? So what if you, you continuously, usually you continuously improve your MT system and then your uh, post-editing system uh, has to kind of synchronize with that. Do you have to throw away all the post-edits, retrain new models on the new MT system or can you reuse that? Okay. So in this case, what I did not tell you is that these these um, post these corrections that we learned, this is done on a very very local basis. We're doing this on a dom document by document basis. Basically, basically a translated workload. He receives a document uh, or or a, a part of a document to translate, and um, this post edit propagation mechanism that I just described starts from scratch at every new document. And the reason we're doing that is that one, thing, one of the things that we realized early on is that a lot of these corrections, or a lot of these correction, yes, corrections, are, they're very much um, context dependent. They're document dependent, they're discourse dependent. Uh, whatever you learn one day um, is, is probably not going to be valid in the next document. Uh, because if you're doing this in the long run, uh, it's, it's probably better, more worthwhile um, to just take all of this new post-edited material, consider it as new translations, and feed it back into your machine translation system. I mean, if you're working with a, this, uh, an SMT system. Um, but currently, we're, so we're working really on a document for document basis. So whatever you've done today is forgotten tomorrow. Thanks. I had another question which was, what is the relation uh, of what you're doing with uh, paraphrasing? And can you, can you uh, collect some uh, uh, good paraphrasing examples this way, for instance? Or could you use paraphrasing resources to improve the alignments? So that's a good question. Um, I mean, obviously, when, some, when the translator posts that it's something, it's because he believes it is currently, in the current context, it is wrong. So you could say these, these are, uh, and in some cases, I, in some of the examples that I was showing, uh, indeed, you could say that, well, treatment and stand therapy are synonyms. But yeah, so, <laughs> so. I mean, it's a question of, of, of usage, and, and I mean, your paraphrase is, is a translator's error, <laughs> or <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. I don't know. It's dull. When you do this uh, second part of the statistical post-edition, you actually uh, do not take into account the source information anymore. No. So uh, maybe you explain why you have sometimes some bad error corrections. So what, what could be done, what should be done to still be able to take into account the source information, even during the session uh, That's a very good question as well. Um, so we, we tried to do some, some oracle experiments just to see, well, okay, how far can we take this? What if, what if we had you know, a, a, a bunch of additional uh, information sources? Uh, could we gain much more than we do currently. And um, actually, the, ex the, the Oracle experiments that we did, um, I, so I, I don't have them here, but you, you would gain uh, the, the kind of Oracle experiments that we were doing is, well, OK, given the, the, the corrections that we have, 
uh, the learning corrections that we have in the phrase table, um, um, how close can we get to the actual reference translation? And typically, we were gaining like maybe one point, one additional point. Um, so you could throw in a whole bunch of other information sources to help you decide whether or not to apply a correction that you've seen in the past. You would probably not get much more gains than you would here. So you can try it. But Yes? Uh, you said that uh, maybe uh, a reason uh, why uh, you have sometimes uh, not uh, a gain is uh, uh, because uh, some segments have too many errors, uh, too many post editing uh, in it. So it's, uh, it's uh, compared with what we saw in uh, speech recognition. When, when you have a lot of errors, it's, you cannot learn from this. But this is contra contradictory with the result you show because you, know, you have no gain when there is uh, very few post editing errors. The, the error. So, it's, so okay. The situations where we do have gains are the situations where within a, a single document or within a single yeah, a workload, a translator workload, you have a lot of repeated errors. The same error occurs over and over again. And this is something that, that, that happens. And this is the kind of situation where you will get a gain from this. Um, the, and, and then there are specific examples within, within that a, a given document, there are specific sentences or segments from which uh, you are unlikely to learn corrections because at, at that point, the translator decided this, this machine translation output is not worth fixing. Mm -hmm. I'll just, you know, scratch it and, and start from scratch. So it's a, there's a difference between the two, but you're right. So, so there's, there's like a, a balance between having repeated errors and having a, a, a severe uh, corrections to do where you have to read the whole thing. Mm -hmm. so.